to Varm Blog, and today we are venturing into the history of law and money in Canada. <laughs> um, and I am with Dan Rohde, a, a SJD candidate at Harvard, and we are talking about his field of research, which is the history of money and law, particularly uh, in relationship to the Bank of Canada, but also. We will dip in today about frameworks for maybe understanding the role of law in social and financial change, um, which uh, you have also written on. And I think these two topics are kind of related, but um, one of the things that I wanted to really talk to you about is your research on the People's Bank in mm. uh the People's Bank and the history of Canadian banking. So the, the, the relationship of money and law, I think, is uh, very well understood by one school of neo um And uh, that's the people around, I think, uh, Christine Dazan, who you've worked with. Um, and kind of not understood by anybody else, um, <laughs> which is a, is a broad thing to say, but I think it in this case, it's fair other, you know, um, and this is an interesting rejoinder to stuff like law and economics and which treated uh, you, uh, the Posner school for those mm -hmm. of you who are legally uh, educated and, and initiated into the dark guild of law um, are those of us who even like looked at it from afar. Um, but the Posner School, which really do, does see economics and law as two fundamentally separate but intersecting spheres of which law is supposed to like get off the um, the back of in some ways. Mm -hmm. so we have to include economic decisions and economic costs so that law is not an undue burden on the, particularly case law is not an undue burden on um, on on the development of the economy and. Uh, Kristen Dawson's work, your own work, uh, pretty much just like points out that that is a totally misguided um, framework for even understanding how the intersection of money and law, the economy and law works, because the, you can't separate them in spheres, like at all. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. Would you like to talk about um, your research a little bit and specifically like... Um, why there's been a shift in this understanding of money and law? Uh, sure, sure. Well, first off, thanks for having me on. Uh, happy to be here. Um, yeah, it's a really big first question. Uh, I think I'm going to start by saying that, at least with me, I wasn't thinking about law and economics at all when I've done basically any of my research. Um, I haven't been trained in it. I don't particularly study it. One of my doctoral supervisors is a law and econ guy. Uh, Reiner Crackman. Um, so I know a little bit, but it's not, it wasn't my target. It wasn't my focus. Honestly, I kind of couldn't care less. And I don't think, honestly, Christine Dazan cares that much about it either. I think she cares a little more than me, but not all that much. I think she much more focused on conventional views of money and economic analysis, uh, broadly speaking, which to my mind is quite distinct from law and economics. I actually see law and economics as very much a legal academic mode. I don't think it has that much to do with economics, honestly. Um, uh, and I think Chris has econ, more broadly speaking, in mind much more than law and economics. Um, why this shift now? You know, I don't know. Um, you know, the, the canned answer, uh, which I think is probably true for the most part, is that it has to do with the great financial crisis. I think um, there was this this weird, dark period. I, I don't know how old you are, but I'm 40. So, you know, born in 1983, my... Um, my like sort of political upbringing, uh, I remember during like the, the first Bush years and the Clinton years, and there was this really, to my mind, just deeply depressing sense of triumphalism with sort of how we manage the economy, how we manage democracy, the American mode being more globally adopted. It was just this post-Cold War sense of blind confidence, not even optimism, just kind of confidence. And I remember going to university uh, and thinking just, you know, God, is there any role for politics in this country going forward? Because it just seems so stuck and depressing. And I think the, uh, and I think 9-11 and the great financial crisis 
really sh shook things up and totally, um, you know, uh, uh, divided our politics in a lot of ways and made a lot of things that people thought were off the table because there was so much consensus about them in certain sectors, particularly economics in general. And it just um, made them sort of up for grabs more. And I think it was a motivating factor for Chris. I think it was a motivating factor for a lot of scholars that she works with a lot, like Morgan Ricks, I know, was you know working, I believe, for the New York Fed during the great financial crisis, maybe ministry. I forget which office he was working for. Um, and I think it was a really sh a, a real turning point for at least the scholars that I'm learning from and in our lives in a lot of ways that we're still living out from. And then, of course, the, the COVID crisis has even magnified that. You know, central banks have become such an everyday news item that uh, you almost can't help but think new scholarship and new approaches and revisiting old approaches and old scholarship is going to resurrect at this time. So I know it's sort of the cliche answer. Everyone's going to say the great financial crisis, but I don't think it's probably true. Uh, so that's my answer for why this shift in thinking about money today. So one of the things I think that we always in uh, heterodox economic world, both in the MMT world and actually in the Marxist world, is the, the underlying assumption that the central bank mm -hmm. should be a creature removed from politics, but also in some ways, like <clears throat> removed from legal structure and legal review. Even mm -hmm. um, you you wrote a blog post uh, for Just Money about two years ago on this very uh, idea and problem, and I do right. see it related to the rest of your research. So, so. In very brief, what do you think are the problems with with viewing the central bank as a private independent institution, um, both legally and socially? Okay, another very broad question, but a good one. Um, so, so I was actually teaching about this somewhat recently. I had the the pleasure of teaching a workshop at Harvard Law School, and I. Um, have a session on central bank independence. And the way I structured it was we started out with sort of the consensus story of central bank independence as you read it today. We read a piece by Rosa Lastra about it. Excuse me. She's probably the pre preeminent scholar of it, legal scholar of it today, I would say. And, and the story goes like this. It says, once upon a time, central banks worked for governments. This ran the risk of governments, you know, exploiting their power to inflate the economy and get reelected. That's a bad set of incentives. So we removed central banks from government, from uh, from the elected branches of government, made them independent, because then those incentives are gone, and these economists who are independent can run the central bank monetary policy with the best long-term interests of the economy as a whole, rather than short-term political interests. And w one of the things I find so disturbing about the story is that it's so divorced from the history of central banking. The whole push for independence is a very late 20th century thing. Um, and if uh, at least this version of independence. And if you look, there was another push for central bank creation and central bank independence in the interwar period, but it had a completely different framing. It was all about how we need to get back to certain fixed exchange rates following the gold standard. And it was all about how central banks shouldn't be independent and run by economists. They should be privately owned. So independent from government, but in a different way, not a government institution run by economists or insulated from review, but privately owned institutions who will act in the best interests of business, specifically um, international business. And uh, British central bankers were a big part of this movement. Montague Norman traveled the world advocating for it, as did a bunch of other people who worked for him and others. And so it was a completely different, a related, but different view of central bank independence. And, and it just, it, it threw me that the idea of central bank independence is very old. In fact, the idea of central banks being government agents is somewhat new, it's sort of a, a World War II-ish and afterwards era mode. And, and it, you know, when you think about uh, things in such a narrow light historically, I think you miss the fact that, um, that there's really law behind this whole picture. There's law behind the central banks that are privately owned, law behind contemporary central independent central banks, and law laying the foundation for even private banks. And, you know, at least my research in Canada, shows that private banks, as they were first created, were very much understood as legal institutions, as state delegates, as serving a public purpose. The chartered banks were even called public banks, to contrast with, say, a private or a partnership-based bank. 
or what was called the joint stock company, which had been a non-chartered company. And, uh, and so if law is behind the whole thing, then the idea of central bank independence, at least this is what I said in the blog post, really becomes an idea of monetary independence writ large. You know, if money is a public thing, if money has governance powers, governance role, then we need to think of it as a governance project. And as a public project, not necessarily a state project, but a public project, project generally. And central banks are a piece of that. They're not even the whole story. Um, I'm not even sure if that's where you were going with this question. <laughs> I apologize, but that's that's where I got uh, with my thinking on it. And um, a, a big driver for my work uh, and the work I have in draft form currently is to emphasize the public nature of money, the public nature of banking, even private banking, the legal architecture on which it is all created and established so that it's open for democratic contestation. And that doesn't even mean, this is something that I think gets confused a lot in the, the Twitterverse on this. That doesn't even mean I'm an advocate of the state nationalizing all of this stuff. Although in some ways I am, I, I'm actually a big advocate of public banking in some, in some sectors. But it's just recognizing the public role of these institutions because that changes the whole discourse around how they should be managed, regulated, understood. I think it changes um, how we look at uh, bank regulation in terms of big banks versus little banks. I think it sort of ends the privileging of little banks. I think you look at all banks as public institutions and you should look at them all somewhat similarly. I know a lot of Americans hate that idea. Um, so I think it's not just about sort of this is public, therefore the state should own it. It's more this is public, so the state should own up to it. And we should all own up to it and engage with it in that light. I think that's probably the main motivating force between behind um, all of my scholarship right now. So, yeah, that answer is actually pretty clarifying. And one of the things that I wanted to uh, kind of bring up with you, specifically mm -hmm. in the episode, in you know, uh, I be first came aware of you uh, of a, a guest interview slash piece you did for money on the left on the on the, the bank of the people in Can i believe it yet yeah, in canada yeah, yeah um but there's an inclination which that story kind of plays against which is the the you know fear of too big to fail banks and corporate yes. uh, bank malfeasions of of which in the united states i actually do think <laughs> it's a problem but it's not a problem because the banks are big right uh, the, the s the svb bank which is which was a small bank and for those of you who are not watching but listening that is me putting things in quotation marks right, right, um, yeah yeah quite large but, actually yeah. but a regional bank let's say not not a national institution right. yeah a regional bank and, and regulated like a regional bank because yes. one thing that we have to to realize is uh large banks and small banks are, are regulated quite differently and there's a lot more oversight on the on the larger, the larger, the national banks, um, even if they do get certain favor, like privileges and like debt resettlements or whatever, um, that make uh, regional banks very attractive for certain kinds of speculation, for certain kinds of investing, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. for stuff that's sketchy, <laughs> just to be quite <laughs> honest. Um, and so, when you say like you know small banks are part of the problem um a lot of the americans particularly after the the great recession and its relationship like recoil at that because they're not thinking about the role of these regional banks even though mm -hmm. regional bank failures were a big problem um I mean, they were a huge part of the of the Great Recession. I remember I lived in a state that had a ton of regional banks, and uh, they were going out of business like every other day. Mm -hmm. um, I live in a state that has them now. That where even after SVB, where where if it wasn't for um, Fed intervention, a lot of the regional banks here in, in Utah would also be out of business. Like, mm -hmm. I saw five of the ones that they're worried about. Four of them are here. Um, so you know, this is. Uh, because I tend to live in, in red states with loose regulations, uh, mm -hmm. this has uh, been something I've seen multiple times. Um, what's that issue with 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 the regional banking that people kind of miss from the story of the Great Recession? 
Yeah, great, great. So, um, yeah, it's funny. A lot of those regional banks actually got purchased by Canadian banks um, after the Great Recession. Uh, it, the presence of Canadian banks in the states grew enormously um, as of that moment. Uh, continues to grow, actually. Although a, a, a deal recently, I believe, um, they rolled back on after the contraction in banking in the states recently. So, no, I, but I want to be clear. I'm not saying small banks are a problem. Small banks are great. Um, you know, local credit unions are great. Um, what I'm trying to say is, I think uh, in the states in particular, you have a certain fetishization of small institutions generally. And in some cases, that might be great. Uh, I think in the banking sector, it can lead to some some thinking that I disagree with. For example, I think the Dodd-Frank regulatory uh, array created after the great financial crisis is built on a false idea. And it's built on the idea that banks are private. They're private institutions, not just privately owned, but private in terms of not that different from any other business. And, uh, but when banks get to a certain size, they can have systemic impacts, which makes them um, uniquely volatile and important to regulate a certain way. Therefore, there's a tiered system where banks get regulated more intensively higher up. And um, certain international agreements, like the GATT agreements, uh, which require certain bank regulation, only apply to the bigger banks in the States, unlike in other jurisdictions like Canada, where they apply to all banks. I believe they apply to all banks in Canada. I should double check that. Um, and, and what I don't like about this thinking is it doesn't think about banks qualitatively. It thinks about, about them quantitatively. So it thinks, you know, once a bank gets big enough, it's systemically important. Therefore, we should um, apply special regulations to it. It's even though if we won't say it out loud, it's going to be too big to fail. Let's just admit that. And I don't like this way of thinking because a bank I think of as a piece of infrastructure. You know, access to money, access to payments is something we all need to live our daily lives. So aren't all banks really too big to fail? You know, when a utility goes insolvent, it's not allowed to cut off its customers. Right? Uh, there's a whole insolvency and you know trusteeship procedure set up for utilities so that they customers don't cut off from power. That doesn't matter if the utility services all of California or a county of 20,000 people. It's a utility. We don't want people cut off from power because it's fundamental to your daily life. Well, why, uh, why do we think that cutting people off from banks? I mean, maybe there's a, a weather incident or something and people get cut off from power until they fix it. Sure. But we don't think people should be cut off from power because a utility has a bad business model, right? Or, or bad planning. Like SVB didn't have that much sketchy shit going on, to quote you. Um, it was just not very well run, right? They were basically a services company who had cachet within a certain sector and um, didn't really know what to do with all the deposits they got. So it was just a poorly run organization that faced a certain environment, rising interest rates were failed. And why do we think that people should just be unplugged from the payment system and the monetary system because their provider had a bad business model. I think if we think of banks as utilities, we should think, well, then no one should be able to get, no customers should be able to get unplugged, not even business ones, I don't think. And this is where I disagree with a lot of the discourse people said about deposit insurance and how a business interest can be disciplining for a bank or depositors can be disciplining for banks. I think that's unrealistic. Um, so to my mind, it's, it's really, it's understanding banks qualitatively, not quantitatively. And if we do that, then we should admit, I think that banks, regardless of size, should probably face more or less the same regulations. Maybe not the same supervision, you know, a bigger institution is going to require more supervision than a smaller one, but uh, at least the same basic rules uh, regarding how they handle the money, what kind of customer service they're required to provide, that kind of thing. And I think in the States, we worry that once we do that, we're going to put the smaller banks out of business because they can't handle the regulations compared to the big banks. And that's where I disagree with a lot of my, and I'm originally American, uh, a lot of my American colleagues on this. I just think small banks are great. They're fantastic. But do you really need to take this love of small business, quote unquote, which is such a political gold mine in the States and um, privilege it this much? Should we understand banks qualitatively by their role, not by their size? And shouldn't we think about regulation that way? So that's my whole thinking about it. You know, money is public. We need it. Payments are public. We need them, whether they're privately owned or not. And shouldn't that govern how we think about these things, regardless of the size of the institutions? They're, they're, they're just public things. They are. I think that that also marries a very intuitive, everyday sense. You know, people in my family uh, don't understand how when it, it's not like people with PhDs or, you know, not people who worked in finance. 
They don't understand how a bank could fail and someone just loses their money. It seems strange to them. Like, where did it go? You know, they actually think of money in the bank. Um, so I think it's, I, I, so that's where, where my disagreement is on that point. So, so one of the things that I have gotten from some of your historical research is that one thing we should be concerned about is, is this fetishization of small and regional banks and, and also fetishizing their free character as if they're removed from certain kinds of regulations and oversight. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that this could not recreate, I, I don't think that's what you're arguing, but that we can learn from the kind of disaster of uh, North American um, colonial and in the case of the United States, post-colonial until the Civil War, money mm -hmm. where um, <laughs> to say things are a mess is is uh, um, kind of putting it lightly. So you would let, let's talk about the early uh, context. And your specialty is Canada, so let's right, right, sure. And, and I think maybe it's good to look at Canada because a lot of people just assume these problems are so generously unique to the U.S. So right, right, which is ridiculous. Um, yeah. What was uh, Canadian money like in the, in the early 19th century? Great, great. So money everywhere is a governance institution. You don't work unless someone pays you because how could you, right? If you're in a monetized society, you need money. So the people who control the issuance of money or credit denominated in a certain money govern that society or more specifically, the kind of decide who governs that society. And uh, the colonial period is one where administrators and local politicians were very alive to this fact. Um, and so the early, the story of Canadian money in the, in the, let's say the colonial period. So before 1867, that's confederation. That's when we um, say Canada as it is today was first created is very much one over contests over who gets to issue money and what the, and, and what the, the unit of that money is because it decides sort of which imperial power you're tied to. So the, the, the colonies in, this, in Canada, the British North American colonies that became Canada, to be more specific, were really caught in um, uh, between a rock and a hard place. The colonial power said to them, go, expand, trade, conquer, do all the things that we want colonies to do, and ship goods back here, expand our footprint, all of that. At the same time, the colonial powers were very wary of the colonies issuing money to um, marshal the forces needed to do all of those things. Because uh, the US had recently revolted with the continental dollar. It was a big fight in the States about money going all the way to the Civil War, which is around when Canada was confederated as well. And uh, so there was strict limits on colonies being able to issue money. They would be allowed to during limited times for limited reasons, like the War of 1812, but for the most part, colonies were not allowed to issue their own money. The feeling was that would give them more independence, more autonomy, and we're worried about that. So the colonies really kind of stuck. They're told, expand, do all these things. And then they're told, you're not allowed to print the money, you need to do that. And so you have this period of sort of working around the rules, trying to get around the prohibition on monetary issuance, on creating a money, and doing it in creative ways. So one way, and these are all things that the American colonies or the colonies that became the United States um, also dealt with in an earlier period. Massachusetts famously had a whole bunch of fights with the, the colonial powers over its power to issue money. It briefly had a mint. It issued uh, famous bills of credit um, uh, that you know were a model for future uh, British colonies. So all the stuff had been done before, but the Canadian colonies, the first thing they did was they monetized foreign coin. So uh, they would pass a law called the Currency Act usually, and it would actually say the unit of account in our colony is British because there was a British law as of 1825 that said they had to. And then it would say, um, but all these other coins are still good money here. They're legal tender, they can be used to pay taxes. French money, Spanish money, British money, American money, on down the list. And it would say how much each coin was actually worth in British pounds. And uh, British money, for example, was worth, um, a British pound, for example, was worth more than a pound in uh, the Canadian colonies. So they would overrate foreign coin and monetize it by law in order to try to retain more money in their jurisdiction um, because people were always short on money. 
And then they um, uh, briefly got to issue their own bills of credit during the War of 1812, which uh, the colonists in Canada liked very much. I'm not saying they liked the war, but they liked uh, the having the liquidity very much. And then when that got wound up after War of 1812, their next workaround was banks. And the colonial power basically said, okay, we'll look the other way while you charter banks that can issue money, so long as you're chartering banks to loyalists, because uh, we don't want any dissension here. And so the lead up to my Bank of the People paper is really the fight over chartering of banks. You know, we're chartering banks to issue money. Everyone knew it was a public thing at that time, uh, but they thought it should be privately owned, or more or less, the government had a share in the biggest bank in the colony. And it should be limited in terms of who you're giving this power to, because we want to keep a lid on it. We just, we don't want autonomy. We don't want American influence. We don't want Republican influence or reformer influence. We want to keep it tight. And that's really the, that's how I like to divide Canadian money, the history of Canadian money into four periods. The first one I call the colonial period or the settler period. And I think each one of these periods has a fight over a key piece of monetary architecture. And the settler period, the fight really is over banking. Who should get a bank charter? How the banks should be governed? Is it fair to have money issued by privately owned organizations or ones um, associated with loyalists or not? Should we have democratic input into how banks are run, how they issue money, how much they issue? That's really the fight, I think, in each of the Canadian colonies, the monetary fight during the colonial period, sort of the defining architecture of that period. And the Bank of the People paper is basically about a small piece of that in the colony of Upper Canada in the 1830s. So let's talk about the Bank of the People. What, what was the Bank of the People and why did it emerge? Great. Well, it emerged for very much the reason I just said. Uh, the War of 1812 had happened. All this money had been issued and then wound up after the war. And um, colonists wanted more liquidity. And um, the, the colonies started chartering banks to provide it. And uh, there was a group at the time called Reformers. They uh, were four more um, democratic reforms in the colony of Upper Canada. And um, uh, I, they were not necessarily American. Some of them were um, fans of the United States, some were not. There was a, a, quite a spectrum within them. But all of them were in favor of more de direct democratic input into the colonial administration uh, by colonists. And they hated uh, the Bank of Upper Canada, which was the first bank chartered in Upper Canada, saw it as a very pernicious uh, political institution. And they had a, it became a huge part of the platform to oppose the bank and to set up some more democratically uh, issued monetary institution, sorry, more democratically accountable monetary institution. And uh, so th they tried a bunch of things. They tried to get public representatives on the uh, Bank of Upper Canada board, um, some reformers on that board, they failed in that. They tried to get the um, the colony, to, uh, they would, lo would love the idea of the colony directly issuing uh, paper money again, like it did during the War of 1812, but that went nowhere. They tried to create a public land bank, that went nowhere. Um, and then eventually, and of course, none of the banks they proposed would get a corporate charter from the legislature. So eventually what they did was they started a privately owned bank, an uncharted bank, so it didn't have limited liability. It was called a joint stock company, was the, the corporate form, and they called it the Bank of the People and just ran it basically outside of the influence, well, still within the influence, but tried to run it independently of the colonial government um, in order to sort of set an example of, of a more democratic money. Uh, they would lend to people who were ousted by the, uh, the big corporate banks including William Lyon Mackenzie to start a newspaper called The Constitution. He was one of the more radical reformers, not a core person behind the bank, but probably the core political figure of that era. He led a rebellion in 1837 against British rule. They give money to him to start a, a newspaper. They give money to um, often farmers outside of um, the city core and who were often alienated from the Bank of Upper Canada, which typically landed to merchants. And, um, really tried to just offer liquidity to people um, pushed out from the um, political consensus at the time. So and, you, you go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. Now, in your paper, you point out that it, it was very well run. It was real run enough that like 
it did not have to suspend payments during one of the uh, the early banking panics in 1837. And right, I, right. one of the things about the 19th century that I don't think modern North Americans in general appreciate is how unstable banking was. Um, they, mm -hmm. There are multiple banking panics. So we we tend to just know about the one that happened in the 20th century with the Great Depression. But um, right, 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 right. But it was it was well run enough that it and profitable enough that it didn't it could maintain payments even during a banking crisis. Um, and not just a banking crisis, but 1837, I think, probably second to the Great Depression in terms of size and severity for a financial panic in world history. And I could be wrong, but um, just a huge monetary contraction, particularly across North America and in England. Um, and to be the only bank that I know of in the Canadian colonies not to suspend payments is a pretty astounding feat when you think about it. So, you know, the bank uh, was kind of subsumed into the Bank of Montreal in the 1840s. Yeah. Um, in, in, your, in your paper discussion, as you point out, this is, you know, part of this seems to be that it was associated with the, with the, the rebellion of, uh, that we just talked about. Right, um, right. But what else could have been the reason why the why the Bank of the People couldn't stay um, independent? Yeah, well, there was, uh, in the paper, I say there's probably a couple of reasons. Um, one is that it really so the rebellion in the rebellion it lost a lot of its core members who either fled to the states or faced exile or or were just ostracized from the. Um, financial community in Toronto. And um, and uh, at the same time, the great financial crisis, not the great financial crisis, excuse me, the um, panic of 1837 led to a suspension of payments. So the, a law was passed saying banks can, if they want, suspend redeeming their notes for, for specie, for coin. And the, the that ironically actually benefited, not really ironically, actually somewhat deliberately, benefited the Bank of Upper Canada because if a bank now needed reserves for some reason, maybe to expand its business, maybe to facilitate an international uh, transaction. The place to get it was through um, through the bill of exchange market callable on London and the Bank of Upper Canada for historical reasons and, um, you know, because of its uh, influence, basically had a monopoly on that market in Upper Canada. So all of a sudden it could charge a premium for um, these bills of exchange on its competitors. And it did, uh, you know, w without hesitation particularly uh, the Bank of the People, who is, you know, its political enemy. So they really had a hard time um, attracting specie, competing. They got, they got crunched, essentially, in this period, even though they were probably the best run bank in the colony at the time, which is kind of amazing. Uh, and so eventually they sold to the Bank of Montreal. The Bank of Montreal and the Bank of Upper Canada had previously had a tacit agreement not to compete with each other. And it ran out. It basically expired, and they didn't renew it. And then uh, the Bank of Montreal really wanted to expand into Upper Canada. Remember, it was a different colony. It was in Lower Canada, different colony, even though now they're all parts of Canada. And the legislature didn't agree to give them a law saying they could. So then what they did was they just purchased the Bank of the People outright to kind of run it as a branch. The two colonies later get put together under what's called the Union Act, and then they just turn it into an actual branch called the Bank of Montreal. It's actually the site of the Bank of Montreal's main office in Toronto today is on the piece of land where they moved the Bank of the People eventually. Um, and it was its mode of in getting in. But really, I think the founders, I think the founders, they were, even though they ran the bank well, they didn't, I think, want to be bankers. I think they were politicians. They cared about money. They cared about democracy. And they, care, they cared about this stuff deeply, but they weren't looking to start a huge institution that was going to take over the world. I think they were trying to make a point, get a bit of autonomy. And they did that. So even though they sold it to Bank of Montreal, also a very loyalist institution at the time. Um, and there's a, uh, one of the founders of the bank has a defense in his newspaper of why we sold it to the Bank of Montreal. Why did I sell it to my political enemies? And he basically says that there wasn't a future for it. They were um, constricted in terms of being able to attract new capital. And so it wasn't going to go anywhere eventually. So they had to sell it. And then he stays this a particular person very involved in money and public money advocates. They all stayed public money advocates. 
but didn't really get into banking anymore after that. For them, it was more about financial regulation, banking regulation, and the ability of Canadian colonies and later Canada to issue its own money directly, which they did eventually establish. Canada issued its own money from Confederation until um, the creation of the Central Bank in 1934. So I think they just, it was a combination of things. The business got stuck and they, um, they were always more interested in public money than banking per se. I think they got pushed into banking because it was sort of their only place left to go after trying out public money and failing so much. So I think they also probably wanted to get more into public money in general. So I, I, that's not something in the sources, that's me reading between the lines, but I think that those are sort of the main reasons why it, it failed as a project. Didn't fail, but phased out. So how can we contrast the Bank of the People to like uh, banks in Canada uh, a little later, let's say in the early 20th century? Like, mm. Early 20th century, well, radically different. So. Canada, so the Canadian monetary system, very different than the American in some ways, radically different. Um, and um, in the early 20th century of a very different um, monetary architecture than during the colonial period. So first off, it's gold standard era still. So to me, that means um, nations monetize a certain coin of gold, monometallism, assign a certain amount of gold to that coin and say that um, somehow through some means, and lots of countries have different ways of doing this, money will be exchange, paper money will be exchangeable for um, specie money in that amount. And then there's no limits on import or export. So gold becomes kind of an international fixed exchange rate mechanism. Um, that's how I understand the gold standard. Uh, so there's that system. So Canada uh, has a currency act still, it still monetizes foreign coin, American and British, so it's very little Canadian coin. Uh, most of that's gold and um, a little bit of silver, a little bit of American silver. And then there's a, a directly issued government money called Dominion notes, which are exchangeable for gold or silver. And then the banks take those Dominion notes and use them as reserves and issue their own paper money, which is um, uh, bank notes, which are the majority of the money people use. And that's the setup. Uh, the banks, um, there's nothing like the Bank of the People anymore. The small banks have all been bought out by the big banks. Uh, we've had chartered, we've had not chartered, we've had branched banking in Canada since the start. And um, from Confederation, a big push was to have all banks chartered federally and able to operate in every province. So every bank is a national bank, more or less. There's, it's not really every bank, but for the most part. And there's relatively few. As of the 30s, there was basically 10 Canadian banks. We have more than that today, but there's five that have about 80% of all financial assets between them. So they're massive. And so, you know, there's few banks, they're all big. They're all associated with uh, um, the Conservative Party at that time. And uh, they are all national. Um, it's a famously stable system, not necessarily the most democratic, uh, but famously stable. It, there's a, a famous story that during the Great Depression, the zero Canadian banks failed, which is actually true. Um, uh, th but of course, part of that's because they could protect their own bottom line at the expense of their customers, right? There was huge monetary contraction in Canada because uh, the banks had the power to protect themselves at the expense of others. So it's not all good to say that, but you have basically an incredibly stable, not very democratic um, uh, monetary system run by very few institutions, all of which are relatively similar, all running out of Montreal um, and all anchored to this global British imperial system that you might call the gold standard. Um, so that's the early 20th century. It's a polar opposite from what Bank of the People um, advocates and organizers would have liked, to be honest, even though one of them was behind establishing many pieces of that system. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, so it, it does seem both important and interesting to contrast the American banking system and the Canadian banking system. One of the things mm -hmm. that immediately uh, occurs to me in terms of like conventional modern monetary theory is that the U.S. had uh, something like fiscal sovereignty or, or monetary sovereignty. Let me be, let me use this precise terms. Um, and that's not a term I like, by the way, but it, you, mm -hmm. it, it is in the uh, the annuals of chartalism, so we have to use it when we talk about this stuff. Um, the U.S. had monetary so uh, sovereignty to some degree 
much earlier than Canada. Um, you mean like after the revolution? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and sure, it, sure. It, it, the idea that we would that we would like legally take foreign money um, like that that seems enough with the Americans. That's not really something that we talk about in our history. Right. Like, Although all the American colonies did that too. At least that I know of. I haven't researched all of them. Um, when did they stop? I don't know. I, I doubt it was right after the revolution. In fact, I know it wasn't because I believe Spanish, the piece of eight was still legal tender in the United States, at least um, under the first um, Mint Act. But I, I, again, I don't research American money, so I'd have to get into this. Right. Um, yeah, but I'm sure it was a transition and it wasn't immediate that, okay, foreign money is not good money anymore. It's only, you know, the eagle, the silver eagle or the gold eagle or whatever the first coin was. That's the um, that's the good money now. I'm sure it was a transition period. I have no well, doubt. Well, one of the things that that I remember from, from my studying of American money was not so much that foreign money, although I did know that there were a lot of colonies even after the revolution that took Spanish currency. Now that I think about right, it. Right, right. It was the, I think it's the basis for the first American dollar, which was silver. It had the same amount. And I believe it's even where the word dollar comes from because it was sort of a German word yep. for the piece of eight. But I think people actually debate that. Um, so when we, when we talk about that in, in the United States, there is, there's also this period of, uh, of extensive private money, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, where you know banknotes were were w which would be traded like money uh, were were kind of everywhere. And but when I say banknotes, sure, people sure. think I mean like you know um, do you know dollars are you like no these were these were basically something like I mean the current would be like if you could use cashier's checks to pay the government. Um, and that cashier check was not denominated in in exchange for an entered in amount of the federal dollar of which it will get a guaranteed return of said federal dollar. Mm -hmm. uh, you have something like that, which which we means that before the Civil War, we do have kind of financial chaos. Um, yeah, although I, I might, I'm going to, I'm going to disagree a bit with your characterization, and okay. maybe we actually agree. Um, but so, so you read this account a lot. In fact, I just picked up a book um, that somebody gave me the other day, which was about this. You read this account a lot. I, I think of it as sort of the Whig history of American money, and it says mm -hmm. this: It says once we had this thing called the central bank, it was the Bank of the United States. It was fantastic. Second Bank of the United States, stabilizing force, great. I mean, forget that it actually wasn't a stabilizing force, but the, the story says it was. And then um, Jackson and all these medalists, backward thinking people, um, didn't like banks, vetoed it, canned it. We had um, free reign in banks, you had the wildcat era, unbridled capitalism, and it was um, productive, but horribly volatile, complete monetary chaos. And you did have monetary chaos, by the way, I'm not disagreeing with the, the empirical statement, um, until finally the civil war happens we get national banking and eventually the federal reserve and here we are back on the path of enlightenment and progress um, isn't that fantastic capitalism's great but it needs to have be checked it's a very sort of middle left capitalist perspective right um yeah. and what it's i was taught frankly <laughs> oh yeah no that's how it's taught and i disagree with it i disagree with it for a lot of reasons um number one the bank of the united states was not a central bank it was a national bank it was competed with all the private banks um and it was the only bank allowed to branch in the United States. All the other banks were supposed to be unit banks, even up to national banking banks were supposed to be unit banks. And uh, it's very hard to run a bank stably as a unit bank. Uh, branching is a hugely stabilizing force. By the way, I'm not saying it's necessarily good, although I think on the whole it is good. That's just saying it's a stabilizing thing for banks to be able to branch and have deposits in different regions. So you're not like SVB, one WhatsApp group, and everybody pulls out their... Um, their reserves and you're tanked in two days, right? It's better to have people spread out. So having branches is inherently stabilizing for banks and no one was allowed to, except for the first and second bank of the United States. And you also have this very confusing document called the United States Constitution, which is just, just horribly confused and scattered and was mixed on money, right? Like the Articles of um, Confederation was even harder on money and uh, a big motivation for the constitution was to have monetary power um, consolidated under the federal government. Mm -hmm. but, it's, but it didn't give the federal government exclusive power to charter banks. 
So all these state governments that can't issue bills of credit anymore start chartering banks to basically issue money for them, kind of like the Canadian colonies did. And they're accepting these banknotes for public payments sometimes. They're using them to fund school boards and infrastructure projects. So these banks are becoming sort of mini central banks all over the country. And you have this huge contest between the governance power of states versus the federal government and of whose banks. And that's a whole background picture of this. It's not just, oh, there was this nice enlightened federal government that had a branched institution. It was competing with these state banks and they hated it for that. And Jackson knew very well where his political support was coming from. It wasn't just about hating banks. It was about hating this certain federal institution that was actually acting against him. And I'm not a Jackson fan, by the way. I think he was a horrible person and should be off for money, you know, genocidal. I'm just saying uh, his supporters weren't all lying all the time. <laughs> you know, some of the things they were saying were true. And so I see all of that not as sort of, we had monetary chaos and we figured it out even though there's a certain point in which that's just true. You know, having banks issued, having all these unit banks issuing these notes, that are getting discounted in various places. There's no way of anchoring their value nationally is a mess and it's confusing. And then, you know, there is stability later, or at least something like it. But I see that much more as sort of a fight over control of the country. And, and, uh, and the monetary instability is almost um, an implication of that uh, more than the driving force. So I, I see this as just a fight over what kind of country are we going to be? Who's going to run it? Are we going to be a slave economy? Uh, you know, where's our money going to come from? Is it going to come from banks or metal? Um, you know, Jackson supporters also owned the mines and ran the mint. So they had direct interest in getting rid of bank issued money because they wanted more coin, right? And they pioneered reforms to the mint during that same period. So I see this as much more of a contest over power than I do a just sort of our money was a mess and we got it more stable later. I mean, and it, it is true money was a mess and it was more stable later. Uh, but I don't think that's the driving narrative. At least that's not how I understand that piece of American monetary history. Is there a similar period in Canada, but, or does the Canadian relationship to the British Empire kind of preclude that problem? Uh, it, it's less about the relationship to the British Empire okay. than it is about um, actually one of the founders of the bank. Um, who was Canada's um, third minister of finance. And um, sorry, I have to I write for a quick message to my spouse. Um, so sorry, Sir Francis Hinks is one of the founders of the bank. He's the first cashier of the bank. He's the third minister of finance. And he lays some of the architecture of Canadian finance that sets it on a radically different path than American and makes it inherently more stable. And it's always been more stable. So he, as you know, is a big advocate of public money. Uh, he was a uh, part of the Bank of the People. Um, so Canada's first government after Confederation in 1867 is um, a conservative government. He feels like I'm on the way out. He was a big part of what was called the um, Union period. Um, and so he leaves, he becomes, I think, Governor Barbados or something like that. So he's out of town. Uh, the new conservative government puts in a, um, a Minister of Finance and a bank fails. The Minister of Finance wants the government to bail out the bank. Uh, the Prime Minister actually has money in the bank and he thinks it's bad politics if he bails it out. So he doesn't bail it out. There's huge political fallout. People think they should have bailed out the bank. And the Minister of Finance is sort of the fall guy. So he, he resigns. Second Minister of Finance comes in and he says, hey, I want a central bank, issues all the paper money. Banks shouldn't be able to issue any money. And he was a former banker. So people were kind of shocked by that. Hugely unpopular with the banks. He gets kicked out, resigns. Uh, and so the, the prime minister, first prime minister, is thinking, what am I going to do? I need a, a minister of finance who knows money, uh, can run this thing. And so he reaches across the aisle and asks a former reformer, old school reformer, left-wing guy, Sir Francis Hinks, will you come back from Barbados and be my minister of finance so we can get a bank act established, so we can get a, money, uh, a monetary system established? And Hinks does. He's a big advocate of having the government issue all the money, but he knows it's a political no-go. So what he proposes is a compromise. The government will issue these notes called Dominion notes. The banks get to keep their power to issue their own notes. Okay, And, um, and he also, what he does is he, he proposes a bank act that's national. So every bank in the country is, uh, comes under it. So as the country grows, they were all assuming the country would grow. Um, the monetary system will grow with it stably. And what he does is he says the Bank Act replaces the corporate charter of every existing bank. So to get a charter, you appeal to the legislature. 
they give you a bank charter. And um, but once you have your charter from the legislature, the Bank Act replaces your charter and becomes your charter. And then he did something, I think, brilliant. He made the Bank Act, uh, he gave it a sunset clause. So it expires in 10 years. So uh, the first Bank Act was 1871. So in 1881, uh, the act was going to expire and all the banks were going to lose their corporate charter unless they show up in Ottawa and negotiate with the government about having a new Bank Act. Um, thankfully, when they got a new Bank Act, they kept the sunset clause in it. And they eventually changed it, so now it's every five years. So for, for a while, it was every 10 years, now it's every five. All the banks go to Ottawa, and the government has sort of a, a stick, you know, has a carrot and a stick. And it's like, come to Ottawa and negotiate a new financial system or a new financial rules. And we do this in Canada every 10 years. Unlike in the States where maybe you have a financial crisis, money is in the pol political scene again, everyone's scrambling to make a new law, and then we're going to kind of sit with that law until we have another financial crisis. Not necessarily the best way to legislate. Instead, in Canada, we have a system where our constitution says all banks are chartered by the federal government, not the states, or not the provinces. Um, they're all chartered under this one system. They come under this one statute called the Bank Act. It expires every 10 years, so all of them have to show up in Ottawa and renegotiate the terms of their own, uh, you know, regulatory apparatus regularly. It's um, it's got some problems. I have I'm a critic of lots of aspects of it, but compared to the American system, it's just so radically different, right? You have unified authority under a federal government, and it's quite deliberately made that way. You know, the Canada Canadian Confederation happened during the Civil War. Um, I think it was widely understood that. Um, that division of the money power between the federal government and the states was uh, one of the causes leading up to the Civil War. And they didn't want that in Canada, right? They wanted stability and unity. And so it was deliberately designed with this in mind, right? Um, and to a certain extent, quite effective, I think. Uh, definitely a huge, at least a huge contrast from the American model. So in, in your writing on uh, SVB Bank, you pointed out that like, Canada has actually had similar periods of mm -hmm. problems with these kind of regional bank volatility, particularly in the in the in the eighties. Actually, about the same same time as our savings and loan crisis here. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, what has Canada done uh, uh, to to ensure that it doesn't have those problems now? Because mm -hmm. it hasn't had the same kind of volatility that we have. Right. Well, uh, first off. The fact that from the start, every bank is branched and national is itself a stabilizing force. Um, second, but we have had these periods where there's perhaps people who are entrepreneurial in a certain area. Uh, and I don't mean that just as a compliment. I mean, in terms of just their motivation. Or you have an area that feels like it's being hard done by with the Eastern banks. I'm putting that in quotes. You know, there was definitely a feeling in the 80s that um, Alberta, Calgary, these areas were um, you know putting their deposits in banks that were run out of Toronto, Montreal, and were getting uh, investments from those banks in return. And so there was a push to open up banks in those areas to cater to that um, community. Right? So that, those are the two community banks that, not community banks, regional banks that failed in the 80s. Um, and, and they failed relatively quickly. I think uh, both were bailed out by the federal government. All the depositors were funded by the federal government. Um, and there was political controversy not compared to the SVB crisis. I think, uh, you know, in Canada, people accept that banks are too big to fail. I'm not sure it's explicit, but I think it's implicit in the system. Um, uh, you know, when you have five banks running 80% of your financial sector, I think it's just, it's almost just a fact of life that you don't even really challenge that much. Um, you know, you can, uh, and they've had it this way. We've had it this way for so long too, that there've been a few institutions that ran the vast majority of the money for almost the entirety of the country's history, that is almost just an implicit mode in this country. Um, there's very little um, discussion of it, honestly. And um, there's some probably some good things to that and some bad things, but it's very different than the US. You know, the US, you had unit banks, they've always been volatile. And you have this period in the Great Depression when there's a push for stability, primarily through deposit insurance, which predated the 30s. There were state deposit insurance schemes before then. And deposit insurance is a pretty brilliant thing. And I'm a big advocate of lifting the cap on deposit insurance, particularly in the States. I think in Canada, 
it's maybe a little different because deposit insurance was rolled out here later and for different purposes. Um, but, you know, we think of deposit insurance is really an equalizer between big banks and small banks. You know, one of the reasons it's so brilliant in the American system is because you have all these small banks. You have people who love them and advocate for them. So why not create a system that says that, you know, your money is as safe in a big bank or a small bank uh, because they're all part of this insurance scheme? I mean, it's kind of brilliant. Um, in Canada, it's just a very different system. We have deposit insurance, but it was rolled out in the in the um, 60s for very different reasons, uh, mostly for non-banks. There was a worry about shadow banks then. They called them near banks, which are also part of the deposit uh, insurance scheme here. Uh, so it, it, it's, 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 it's a radically different system. It's really designed with stability in mind. And I'm actually not sure um, how many components of the American monetary system are actually designed with uh, stability in mind when you think about it. Some are, but there's just so much politics and jockeying and conflict and contestation in the American, in American monetary history um, that the whole history of the entire architecture is almost, almost opposite the Canadian approach. Hmm. So this leads us to uh, kind of the final point that I want to talk to you on, and it is a shift. Mm -hmm. um, the the background of all these all these specific bank arrangements that we've been dealing with is both fiscal arrangements, but also legal arrangements, as mm -hmm. you know, as stated by the fact that you know charters are legal entities. Uh, money is a legal is, is a legal issuance it, mm -hmm. it, its viability is based on the fact that not just that you know private entities in the market take it because private entities in the market can take whatever they like really in a lot of mm -hmm. a lot of places but not everywhere but uh, mm -hmm. in the united states it's most true um but that the government can can will take that form of currency as a receipt and so this leads me to a kind of key question. Um, you've also done work on frameworks of understanding law mm. and the, the role of law in social change and social institution building. Um, you recently published a paper, uh, a, a long kind of <laughs> exhausted paper <laughs> with uh, Nicolas uh, Herrera. Yeah, Nico. Um, um uh and um you you talk about uh contingency and autonomy and and legal historiography those are words that i will you know kind of translate for but i think most people know what what uh contingency and autonomy are i think most of my audience does have an idea of what historiography is because I'm mm -hmm. really big on emphasizing, hey, don't confuse historiography for history. Mm. A lot of people do. Yeah, um, no, it's true. Um, so, uh, but how was money a window into understanding the relationship between law and social change and a window that I think a mm. lot of people ignore? Mm. Oh my God, what a great question. I mean, I think I want to answer your question backwards or in reverse. So okay. I think it's so easy to, it's easiest to ignore the things we use most often. Um, I think that's just a fact of human experience. I think you can't possibly think about something that you do every minute as being, it's not that you can't, it's very hard to think about something you use regularly um, as something worth remarking on and focusing on and trying to tease apart because you live with it, you know, uh, it, it, so it's, it's just, you just be exhausted from the mental labor of it. So I think these everyday things are sometimes the hardest for us to think about and the easiest for us to ignore. Money is definitely one of those things. You know, when you go about your day using money of various kinds, I, you know, you don't think about the design behind it and what it means. And, and we should at least once in a while. And, you know, that paper is really about um, how does law enable historical change, not just reflect historical change. And I think money is a great example of this. If you think of money as a legal institution, as I do, as it sounds like you do, um, then, then it's a great example of this because so many monetary innovations happened almost inadvertently. 
you know, um, uh, the Bank of England happens to finance government um, during a period of, um, of uh, monetary contraction and conflict. And then suddenly this scheme, which was really just a scheme to give the government of England a loan, right? And they didn't have enough liquidity for the loan and the government had terrible credit because it had, you know, basically taken people's money from, uh, from them. Uh, they were like, you know, you investors will give us better terms if we give you this corporate charter and work out the scheme where you give us paper notes and have a reserve and you can run this bank on the side to make some money as well. It was just a scheme to get a big loan for the government. Um, the notes were not legal tender. They were not meant to be accepted as taxes, but they were accepted as taxes very soon because uh, there's a logic that if the government is going to spend these notes on things, then it should accept what it spends. So all of a sudden the exchequer is kind of stuck accepting these notes inadvertently um, and all of a sudden you have this new institution, the Bank of England, which over the subsequent, you know, um, uh, 300 years has become enormously influential and important globally, emulated around the world, taken on various different roles. Um, it's wild. So our whole paper is basically about how you have these moments of political contestation, which people are trying to pioneer a new legal device or institution of some kind. And then later on, that device kind of runs away from them. It gets used in ways they didn't expect. And that's the autonomy of law. That's how law enables certain social um, or modes of social organization that weren't foreseen by its uh, creators and that enable new structures of society. And money is filled with examples like this. You know, if you see money as a legal institution, you see money as something that can be designed. And the designers hardly ever know uh, the impacts that their designs are going to have long term. Um, I think this is definitely the case for bank issued money. Um, and the, the Canadians get to it kind of late. You know, lots of other countries have been doing this for quite a while by the time the Canadian colonies start chartering banks. And, um, and it's just, that's the story I like to tell with legal history. You have the political fight over the new institution, and then you have how the new institution is used. And it's used in a certain way, and then later it's used in new ways. And people are just like, how did that, how did that happen? The, the Bank of Canada is a great example uh, a current draft I'm working on says that when it was founded, um, not only was it not meant to manage domestic price inflation, but uh, the creators explicitly didn't want it tasked with inflation. They actually thought it was dangerous to task a central bank with inflation. It should manage exchange rates, advise government on its finances, uh, print the money, regulate the financial system, do various things. It should not handle inflation, not just not just we'll leave it open, but we're against this. And then there was a huge shift in the 60s and this new governor of the bank just started using it for that. It was sort of an old idea that central banks should be used for that, that had gone out of fashion in the 30s. And it came back with him. And all of a sudden central banks around the world, you see similar things happening in the post-war period. Um, I just think it's really fascinating how these institutions that we use every day get used in new ways and they have such a huge impact on our everyday life. Um, it makes them both hard to pay attention to and so important. And um, and I think the more we can make them explicit through these histories, the more we can think about designing a monetary system and a legal architecture uh, for the future that represents the kind of society we'd like to live in. I think that's really the animating force of all my historical work is thinking about how we can equip ourselves to change these things for the future. I think it's very practically motivated um, even though it's almost purely historical. Did that answer your question? I feel like I went on a bit of a, trend, uh, a digression there. No, I mean, it, it, it is mildly digressive, but it's the kind of thing I'm actually interested in. Oh, right. Um, one of the things I think we have to deal with when we deal with law is seeing it as, it, as uh, definitely in feedback with all these other parts of society and government and social change. And sure, there's, sure. there's kind of two, you, you go into, you know, um, the various modalities in your paper, classical legal thought, law and society, Marxism, uh -huh, uh -huh. New, left, new left, post Marxism, critical <laughs> history, uh, you know, and what you, you guys, you, uh, term of you guys own invention, um, millennial consensus. But I do think that, that, if I was going to radically and irresponsibly reduce those into two trends, you have mm. the uh, law as neutral arbitrator of society school and law as epiphenomenal to other relations of power school. 
and <laughs> right right and what we're trying to say is neither of those two yeah yeah you're innovating right. both those things <laughs> yeah 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 no i think that's right i think that's right um uh it, it's definitely a a harsh uh simplification of all the camps but i don't think you're wrong i don't think you're wrong i see what you mean right well yeah i mean i do think each of these camps has different reasons why they conclude Mm -hmm. these two different things and i i used to be of the marxist school that like well law is just a reflection of currently existing power relations where i do you know i do think that currently existing power relations are very important to to law but they're oh, also yeah. created by law so oh exactly yeah the legal architecture lays the foundation of these power relations but then within that, there's no question that certain interests get an outside voice in changing the laws. I mean, there's no better example of this than contemporary United States. You know, of all the history I've ever read, <laughs> there's like no better example than contemporary U.S. and the influence of, you know, uh, established powers on the structure of American laws. When you have multiple um, elected representatives reading pieces of the same speech against Obamacare uh, given to them by uh, an insurance uh, lobbyist. Remember when that happened? This was, I don't know. It was just, I do it was remember just, this. Um, I'm about just, the same age you are. So. Yeah, just <laughs> appalling, you know? Yeah, so no question. You know, the Marxist story, and that's, I think, also to be specific, that's probably one version of the Marxist story, um, definitely has some truth to it. There's no question. It's just, you know, where do the foundations of these things come from? You know, how do you have a move towards piecework and, you know, capitalist labor relations, as Marx would say, without the liquidity needed to pay people hourly instead of, uh, you know, laborers used to get paid every year, right? Because money was so scarce in England, you get, you know, your two and a half pounds every year um, on your annual employment contract. And in the meantime, you'd be fed by your employer and you get billed for that when you get paid at the end of the year too. Um, uh, you know, how do you move from that system to a system of, you know, capitalist hourly labor uh, structuring without liquidity and all that liquidity is created through law. So there's clearly legal ar architecture behind the system of production in the base, even if within that there's lots of examples where the Marxist narrative very clearly plays out. Um, so I think, I think what you described is exactly, that's exactly the kind of approach we're, we're showing in the paper or trying to. Yeah. I, and I, I found the paper, well, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to link the paper in the show notes, but I, 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 I detailedly read the first 10 pages because I got this paper yesterday and then I skimmed the other 40. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. I don't blame you. I don't blame you. It's big. <laughs> um, but I will be reading this whole paper because I, I am, I'm, I think that, that there are two areas, weirdly Marxism's uh, thought thinking on money is anemic. Um, right. It mostly goes back to capital. There are historical reasons for that in capital. There's stuff that, I, you know, stuff that even me as a fairly orthodox, well, as a formerly fairly orthodox Marxist, has had to admit just aren't historically completely accurate, although they are accurate to the readings of, histor of, of economic literature that Marx is working with mm -hmm. to some degree. Uh, although a friend of mine uh, pointed out that Marx misreads William Petty's pretty badly. Um, that's not here in the there, but one of the, one of the things that, that I have had to deal with is, uh, Marxism and modern money is not really properly developed. It, it's, mm. it, it's, uh, um, I mean, in Marxist circles, sometimes you still have debates about whether or not everything is still secretly somehow actually on a gold or some other commodity money standard that we just don't understand. Right. Which is like, no. <laughs> I don't really know what else to say yeah. about that. Yeah. Um, and and then the other the other thing that Marx has been late to Marxism, Marx didn't deal with it that much at all. In fact. When he wrote about it in his journalistic writings and tended to outsource this to Engels, um, is is law. Like mm -hmm. law, law is you know there are Mar there are Marxist schools of legal thinking. I think they kind of develop in the nineteen fifties and sixties, mm -hmm. but um, in general, uh, the old adage that well, law is just the you know the, the ruling committee of capital, so you know we're not really going to think much about that mm -hmm. is, uh, is, is, 
leads it to be anemic. And the only time you really deal with Marx thinking about law that rigorously at all is in his responses to Ferdinand LaSalle, who is a lawyer and views law as a, as a like class neutral arbiter. Uh, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, and so there's this big debate between them on that. And, but beyond that, you don't get a whole lot of like, you, you know how Marxists are. Uh, maybe you don't, but yeah, I know a few, I know a few, <laughs> uh, you know, we tend to be pretty, pretty, uh, some, sometimes somewhat limited to like three or four texts of which we proof text for everything. So, um, that's kind of a problem in our thinking. Um, mm-hmm. and it's one that I have for my own purposes, tried to change what I see is like what I see is going on a lot. And basically, similarly, I think all the views as currently exist tend to be too reductivist as to what law is and what it is doing and mm-hmm. who and mm-hmm. how it serves. Uh, uh, the worst case of this in Marxist legal thinking is just to, is just to view it as um, part of the irrelevant superstructure, you know, which is a disaster. So, right, right. I think even even um not even a great reading of marx when i've read people put that view in so all right a a few thoughts Mm -hmm. um as someone who's neither a marxist nor mmt at least i don't see myself as um uh i think i think i really agree so marx you know i I see i've been told that dan just pick up capital again read (laughs) volume three you know he's actually compatible with the stuff if you dig in and i just don't think he is and i could be wrong but i just don't think so I don't see myself as MMT, but I do see myself as a credit theorist of money. I see the constitutional approach and MMT as two credit theories of money. So sort of allied, but somewhat distinct. And um, I just think Marx's approach is not compatible with a credit theory of money. Marx's approach to money, at least, is not compatible with a, uh, a credit theory of money. And I've dug through capital, uh, again, kind of like you read 10 pages of my paper and skimmed the rest. You know, I've read volume one pretty well and, you know, skimmed the rest. But I have a really hard time finding... Uh, Marx to be compatible. I think you really have to stretch. And that's somewhat deliberate, right? He was trying to outdo the classical political economists at their own game, right? Take their assumptions, think of this as scientific, and try to show how their assum- own assumptions lead to a contradictory outcome. Um, uh, you know, so it, it's part of his game to play their game and outdo them. So it's not really that surprising that he would be, uh, you know, in conflict with the credit theory of money, given the theory of money that they start with, thinking Ricardo here in particular, but also Smith. Um, I also think Marx is um, inconsistent with legal realism, which I think of as very foundational to my view. And I think he just he, he comes from a certain civil law, a German civil law tradition, which is uh, not very compatible with legal realism in general. And I don't think Marx himself is is compatible with that, um, generally speaking. Um, I do think Marx has a, a somewhat more nuanced view of law than a lot of Marxists do. Um, and I, I, I also want to say, and here's, so those are the two initial things. I think he's incompatible with those things, both of which I, uh, uh, uh embrace credit theories of money and legal realism in a big way. Um, that having been said, Marxist scholarship is hugely diverse, um, has its own whole traditions. Nico and I, when you're writing this paper said a couple times, we thought the whole paper could be written from within Marxism. It would just be same introduction, same conclusion only the debate in the middle instead of being legal formalists and you know critical legal studies new left all these people it would just be various versions of marxism you know marx and engels classical marxism you know throw pashukanis in there throw gramsci in there you know do this whole office air right the new left but make it a within marxist debate and you could probably i think you could arrive at more or less our position from within the marxist tradition just depending on who you listen to because the marxist tradition is rich and massive and so obsessed with theory and uh, plenty of attention to law within it as well. You know, a lot of these Marxist historians ended up becoming more or less legal historians, even though I think they never meant to be. So um, so I, I completely agree with you. Uh, uh, and yet I think there's actually room within the Marxist tradition for exactly this type of thinking. I'm not really sure how, given how I read Marx, but I, I think it's definitely there. Well, one thing I will, will say is we have to refer to the Marxist tradition because even when people are 
the creative reading of Marx to make Marx say things that you want <laughs> to say is become a a, a a hermeneutical tradition that now has a a hundred and fifty year old pedigree. So like <laughs> it's it's sure, uh, sure. um and to some degree uh, I when I approach Marx tend to be of the plain reading school, but I also tend to be okay with, like we can agree with eighty percent of of what he says, or we can be good mm. Marxian socialist or whatever and just also go like, but this is wrong or or yeah, like sure. this is limited or this was true in 1850, but it is not true now, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, so, you know, I think that's kind of a grown up way to approach it. And I, sure, I, I, do, sure. uh, I, I have also pointed out that like, is, I love, you know, I do have a, a, a weird love affair with the Marxist political tradition, but, but I have pointed it out to people that like, well, you know, liberal political traditions uh, don't have these kinds of problems because mm. they're not as obsessed with like oh, being yeah. as faithful to one uh, version of what they are as we are. Oh, totally. So, totally. And this, and you see this going back in Marxist, uh, you know, uh, till basically Marx It's just, it's been endemic to the tradition, right? Fiddling over words. Uh, I did want to point out that you, you you said something that I have intuited, and when and I I do a lot of interactions with MMT, neo chartalism, um, credit school of money, uh, mm -hmm. state school, state theory of money, which which I'm going to to say that I started seeing um, uh, as different things, and a lot of people in those schools don't see them as different things, mm -hmm. but I'm like. Mm -hmm. I'm not mm -hmm. sure all credit theories of money are actually modern monetary theory, and, it, right, and right. I'm also not sure that all forms of chartalism are state theory of money are either. Oh, interesting. So, so it's um, what because one of the things is uh, credit theory of money and debt theory of money are both state theories of money, and they sound like they're the same, but they're not exactly actually. Hmm. Um, uh, so these are, these are distinctions. So it, it actually, it's just kind of heartening to know that I'm not the only person, even though you probably wouldn't divide it the same way I do, who, who does see that there are subtle distinctions in these schools. And I actually think that's a good thing. Oh, me too. Uh, me too. Like, I don't say I'm not MMT as a critique of MMT at all. I think it's just, you know, I came into this as a lawyer um, you know, I read Chris's work before I read anything by an MMT person. So like when I happened on MMT as part of my, um, my, you know, prepping for my oral exam for my doctorate, uh, my super, my supervisor, Chris Tazan, she was like, you know, Dan, we should read some Randall Ray. So we put it on the, the syllabus that we read. And it was like, um, I had already accepted that, for example, um, the government can't run out of money. Uh, all, all this stuff, you know, so I wasn't, I didn't read MMT and be like, oh, ah, you know, my, government doesn't get money first with taxes, because I had learned about the legal architecture of money and the legal history of money before I even read MMT. So when I came to MMT, and I did learn a lot from it, I feel like I had already gotten there elsewhere through a different tradition, maybe with different emphasis. Mm -hmm. So I'm not even critiquing MMT. If I was an economist, I'd probably be in that camp. And I think even within MMT, there are people who are more sort of legal approach to money people. Um, who have a pretty big presence on Twitter, and there's probably more state approach to people or state approach to money people, um, who are maybe less on Twitter. So even within MMT, there might be a debate uh, around these points. So I'm not saying I'm not MMT as some sort of a critique or disavowal of it. It's just kind of not where I come from. It's not the tradition I came up in or I learned uh, about this from. And so I quite like MMT. I read all these people. A bunch of them are coming to our conference in uh, two days. I'm very excited to hear them and meet some of them in person for the first time. So uh, yeah, I, I'm with you. I, I, for me, it's just about, it's just an empirical description really of where I'm coming from and what my interests are and my focus is. You know, I don't like to say that money is a creature of the state. I do like to say that money as a unit of account starts through relationships with a stakeholder. Um, a stakeholder can be a state or something else. Um, that money is a legal institution. I think these are somewhat different statements, even if they're both credit theories and they're very similar in a lot of ways. Um, and so I think it's, uh, again, I think it's great to have diversity within these camps and we can be allied and different. And that doesn't mean we're 
attacking each other in any way. You know what I mean? I've learned a ton from these MMT folks, particularly on Twitter. It's incredible. Um, I'm deeply indebted. So I'm not saying I'm not that as any sort of a, a negative thing. It's more just kind of just trying to describe where I'm coming from more than anything. I don't know if that resonates with you. Oh, it, it does. I mean, I uh, I actually started off as a strong critic uh, of, of MMT oh. from its uh, post-Keynesian... Uh, and these people don't consider themselves MMTers anymore, actually, for the most part. But from mm -hmm. its like, left post-Keynesian Minsky development. Uh, and then kind of concurrently to that there is a different development of mmt in in like randall ray and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh going back to rowan mosler uh which which pulled back to uh the german historical school and um hmm. chartalism um which also has a relationship to keynesianism right, through, through through keynes importing the work of uh, knapp into england although they didn't do much with it to be frank Right. Um, right. Uh, but oh, I, as a Marxist, my concerns tend to be much, I think, broader than theirs and more mm -hmm. you know, like I tend to uh, when I critique given tears, uh, it's often not be, I've often come from a standpoint of agreeing with them on their on, you know, their statements about money, their statements about law and mm -hmm. just going like, no, but we do have to look at class relations and power relations. Uh, when we when we propose policy, because otherwise you're at a disadvantage for these policies that you want, and you'll get part of them, but they'll be used perniciously, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Hmm. Um, but in doing that, I've actually been somewhat worn over to many of their arguments. It, it's one of these cases where I went in like totally hostile, and through through a series of debates over ten years, became like, oh no, I think we have we share like ninety percent of the worldview. Ah. Um, and so the 10 percent that i don't share we really don't share but it's not that i'm like oh you know mmt must be destroyed it is the worst thing that uh mm -hmm. and you know and politicized uh and politicized political theory um which that seems like a redundant statement but it, it i think you know what i mean um versus like academic political theory <laughs> yeah totally. um, um there tends to be like uh, unnecessary aggression over 10% and not focusing on the 90% that you actually share and could have common cause on. Oh, especially on Twitter. Twitter right. just seems to be like the place for getting very mad about inane disagreements. <laughs> yeah. For better and for worse. Yep. Um, well, I know you have to go. I'm going to link um, uh, five of your pieces in the show oh, notes wow. so people... Right. Um, can have access to them because I have, I've, I've, I've explicitly mentioned the piece you did with money on the left, but I've also kind of crypto mentioned two pieces you've done with, uh, with just money and also that laws architecture, and then you have a kind of joint piece called uh, with uh, uh, Christine Dazine, uh, Lev Manand, uh, Rowan Gray, Hillary J. Allen, and uh, Raúl Carrillo, Carrillo. If, let me. I know how to speak Spanish. Um, uh, to, um, on the reaction to the SBB bank that I think is pretty helpful and relevant to this conversation. So I'll link all those in the show notes. Anything Great. you, you know, one of the weirdest things about being a socialist podcast is having to plug at the end, but there's anything you want to plug? <laughs> sure, sure. I mean, I think this podcast will probably go up after our conference, but we're having a conference called Money as a Democratic Medium uh, in Cambridge and remotely uh, June 15th to 17th. Uh, this will probably go up after it's done, but whoever listens and is interested should definitely check out the videos. Everybody we've discussed here and many more are, are going to be there. So uh, it'll be great. I think your um, listeners will probably be interested. Yeah. yeah, this will definitely go up after that, but I can find once that is up, I can find the, yeah. the videos. Or, or people can Google it themselves. But yeah, and I appreciate you plugging so many of my pieces. Thanks. Yeah, I think they're important to read. Thank you so much. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. You too. Bye. Bye.